We'll see. Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I am the director of the Ashland Public Library and I'm here today to celebrate Pride Month Woo! <laughs> with three amazing authors and it was going to be four but unfortunately Olivia Waite couldn't be with us tonight. So regardless we're going to have an amazing conversation all about books um, that have LGBTQ plus characters and for the LGBT. I want to say it was for the LGBT community but Really, these books, if you read them, are for anybody. So I'm gonna, we'll be talking about that, but before we get to all of the great conversation we're about to have, I just have a few things to housekeeping things. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to the friends of the Ashland Public Library who support all of our programming and we couldn't do these fun things without them. Um, I'd also like to say that you can buy signed books from Bank Square Books from any of our authors, including Olivia, um, for this program, and I will put the link for that in the chat. Um, I want to say that this is a really special program to me because we are partnering with um, several Massachusetts libraries, and I'll put their their um, where in the in the chat. But I always feel like when libraries work together, you know, we create magic. So we're like, you know, the the unicorns of uh, <laughs> of the library world working together. So I really appreciate that. Um, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. If you have a comment, like where you're coming from, feel free to throw that in the chat. If you have any tech issues, also in the chat, and I'll be taking care of those. Um, so with me tonight are three amazing authors of uh, books with LGBTQ characters or stories. And again, for everybody, not just for people who are in that in the, uh, the queer community. So Emery Lee actually joined us for a um, an our LGBTQ plus book club a few months ago, and we were just so impressed, 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 like just so smart. And the book is adorable, Meet Cute Diary. And um, we'll be talking about Emery's new book in just a few minutes, but I'm really thrilled that Emery decided to join us for tonight. Timothy Janofsky is a new author, um, also a comedian, which I think is hilarious, and writes rom-coms, shocking. So we'll be hearing all about Timothy and his book, um, coming up in a few minutes. Uh, Never Been Kissed, it's his first novel, and it's adorable. Katie Robert, <laughs> what can I say about Katie Robert? She writes unspeakably hot books about Disney villains and um, the gods of Olympus and all kinds of crazy characters who do all, pretty much anything. You know, it's pretty, it, you know, open to anything. And I love that because I think that that's what Books should be. They should open up our worlds to to new and different ideas. And Katie, I think, brings that to the fore just amazingly. So again, Olivia Waite couldn't be with us tonight, and um, I'm sure she's missing us as much as we're missing her. Um, so I'm just going to get started, and um, I'll be asking questions, and I'll be calling on you, as I said. And if um, people in the audience have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. So my first question, and I'm going to start with you, Timothy, is because you have your first book out. Um, and never been kissed. <laughs> Perfect. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Because I went a little bit short on that and about your book. Sure. Yeah. So um, again, my name is Timothy Janowski. I am a self-proclaimed multidisciplinary storyteller, which is just a fancy way to say I like to tell jokes and act in plays and do all that good stuff. But I also write books. And so my first novel, uh, Never Been Kissed, um, it tells the story of Ren Roland, who is backwards over here. Um, <laughs> he's uh, never been kissed, never been in love, but he wants that movie perfect ending more than anything. So on the night of his 22nd birthday, he gets very, very drunk and very, very nostalgic. And he ends up sending emails to all the boys he crushed on before coming out of the closet. And then he wakes up to a response from Oh my gosh, backwards, Derek Haverford, <laughs> his number one pre coming out crush. And what he learned through that interaction is that they're going to be working together at their hometown vintage drive-in movie theater. Um, and they come up with this special project to help save the struggling drive-in. And that leads Ren to think that maybe this is the summer for his perfect kiss before the credits. Um, so you'll have to read the book to find out. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a just a lovely combination of all of my favorite tropes. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's I like to call it trope-tastic because um, I just took all my favorite tropes from rom-coms that Ren loved and I kind of retrofitted them into the story in a way that I hope readers will be able to recognize and then see fun little twists on. Perfect. Emery, how about you? What, tell us about yourself, Meet Cute Diary, and your and we'll, we'll talk about your upcoming book sort of as we get closer to the end. 
Um, oh yeah, so um, I'm Emery Lee. Um, I am a trans author um, and I do a lot of other stuff. I write, I, I do music. Um, I'm an illustrator, that kind of stuff. Um, my first book um, was Meet Cute Diary um, and it's all about a trans boy who believes in love but doesn't think that he can have it because he's trans and a person of color um, and basically he stages this whole blog about trans meet cutes and happily ever afters but the blog is fake even though he tries to pretend that it's real and so when it's exposed by a troll he stages an entire fake romance in order to prove that the blog is actually true and it's a whole bunch of shenanigans um, as he struggles to prove that like the perfect happily ever after is a possibility um, for trans people. Um, and then Cafe Con Lichi is my most recent book. This one just came out um, last month. Um, and it's a rom-com between two sons of rival bakeries as their parents' um, shops threaten to go under. And they basically have to work past their differences and hatred of each other as they try to save those shops and you know see what brews between them and the conflict. Ah, the Romeo and Juliet of bakeries. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> or Romeo and Julius, maybe? Someone, well, there's actually like a pun about that in the book, but someone called it Romeo and Juliet, except they're gay and they don't die. And I was like, I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is perfect. And so, Katie, tell us about yourself and a little bit about your most recent book. Uh, I am Katie Robert. I write the, well, I write a lot of stuff, but right now, the Dark Olympus series, which I am backwards, but this is the third book. It's Wicked Beauty. And it is, they're, Greek myth retellings, but it's like the fast and furious version of Greek myths and that like don't ask too many questions about it's very much not classical it's like get in the car we're going to go on an adventure and this story is a poly romance with Achilles, Patroclus, and Helen and um and there's like a tournament arc and it is just a hot sexy mess is what it is <laughs> so yeah I had a lot of fun with it <laughs> Well, your hot, sexy messes are doing really well. I was mentioning earlier that uh, Katie's books have been picked for the Library Reads Award this this time around. That means that librarians chose it for like their favorite reads, and it's amazing. So um, <laughs> one of the things I noticed about our panel today is the diversity within the panel in terms of what you're writing. Um, yeah, Emery writes YA romance, Katie writes erotica and um, you know, Olivia writes historicals, although she's not here, and um, Timothy writes contemporaries and rom-com. So I, I really find that interesting that um, that we're able to hit all of those subgenres within a genre or within a point of view, I guess. So I'm going to talk about, first of all, romance. Uh, what brought you to writing romance, particularly, and um, why romance, Emery? Um, so for me, it was actually like I've always been into like romantic subplots. Um, but for me, I, I didn't originally write romance. I originally wrote fantasy that just had like romantic subplots. Um, and then it was only after I wrote this really catastrophic like end of the world apocalyptic story where like everyone dies and like the main character spends the entire book thinking that the love of his life is dead and like crossing the country on foot to try to find him that I was like, okay, you know, I need to write something happy. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'll write a rom-com. Um, and it just kind of like spiraled out from there. Like um, when I ended up um, querying, like it really hit it off and like readers were so excited about it and everything. So that's where I kind of like stepped in onto the rom-com train and just kind of went with it. Mm -hmm. And just seems to suit your personality too, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what, I've, what I've gotten from the two times we've met. How about you, Katie? What brought you to romance? Um, I, I definitely like a lot of romance readers started reading it, like maybe too young, maybe not. I don't know. It's, you know, it's fine. Um, I actually came to writing romance sort of on accident because I actually started in YA, like unpublished. Like you'll we'll never see the light of day. But like my initial when I first started writing, I wrote YA. And I just much like Emery, like I really gravitated towards the romantic subplots and then just sort of accidentally wrote a romance. So I was like, Oh, I really like this. This is fun. Like, why haven't I been doing this? And that just happened to be the book that sold. And now I just it brings me so much joy because there's so much room under the romance umbrella to like do all these different things. And I still, I mean, I've been doing this 10 years now. <laughs> I'm, I'm like a dinosaur in romance years, but um, I still get people being like, oh, when are you going to write something that's not romance? I'm like, no, I, 
I won't. I won't. I would like to do fantasy, but it'll be fantasy romance. And so <laughs> this is where it's my, like, I love this place. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's such a need for it too. It's just this constant growth, right? Timothy, how about you? Um, yeah. So, so similarly to uh, what Katie was saying, when I started writing, I was also writing YA. Um, and I was also just kind of gravitating towards um, the romantic subplots of whatever plot I had drawn out. I was always very interested in that romance element. And um, similarly, the book that ended up selling was a romance, a new adult romance that I had written. Um, it's, it's actually my Christmas book, which will come out in October called You're a Mean One, Matthew Prince. Um, and that book was my comfort project when COVID first started because I was out of work, I was stuck at home and I needed something um, joyful. And I was just like, I really, really love Hallmark and Lifetime Christmas movies. And so why don't I write a queer one that won't make me feel good? I didn't think it was going to see the world. But now it will uh, in book form. Um, so I, I, I write romance because I want to find comfort. I read romance because I want to feel comfort. And I hope that I can give some of that to a reader. And so that's kind of how I feel about romance as a whole. <laughs> well, your book just came out like about a week ago. Is that right? Uh, Never Been Kissed came out May 3rd. So it's been almost a month. Okay, so you've, yeah. been, you've been able to give comfort to people for quite some time. And Emory, your book just came out a month ago, you said, so same thing. Amazing. I love it. Um, so I'm going to start off with some questions about the LGBTQ aspect of, of your books, and then we'll go into more of generic. But um, when you're writing your books, um, what's the most important aspect for you to put in your books to that so it's authentic to the LGBTQ community? And I'm going to start with you, Katie. Um, when I, when I first started writing, I wrote pretty much straight romance. Like it just, because it was, again, 10 years ago, we've come a long way. Um, but when I went indie, it was like, I, I was kind of like coming to terms with like my, or not coming to terms, but like, you know, when you grow up evangelical, sometimes you have the blinders on to like what you might be, your sexuality could be or gender or whatever. And so writing kind of helped me sort of explore that but I I just kind of write um I prefer my books to be just like a queer everybody's queer <laughs> like it's just it's not it's never I don't really write like coming out stories just because it's I like write for escapism and I read for escapism and so having that without um just like it's just a thing it's a thing that everybody is nobody has to like have problems with it and you know and I'm writing erotic romance so it's not like I like the frictionless on that there's friction in other places um but as far as like authentic I just it's just really important to me that there's a lot of varied types of characters and stories and whatnot just because there's not a uniform experience to like being queer and so just so it feels like just authentic to that character because I write character first and so I have to ensure that that character feels like really authentic to me which usually hopefully comes across when people read the book that it feels authentic to them as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Timothy? Yeah um, again uh, kind of what Katie was saying because um, I I come from an acting background. Um, so I come to writing also from character first. I usually like to put myself in the shoes of the character and I write from the first person, usually present tense. And so that really is kind of an all encompassing perspective to write from. And so when writing um, queer characters, I'm drawing on my own lived experience as well as the lived experience of my friends. And one of the elements that I love about writing queer fiction is that queer people tend to travel in packs. Um, and so again, I like to populate my stories with as many types of queer people as I can because that's the way I explore the world. That's that's the people I surround myself with a lot of times. And a lot of um, a lot of the media that I consumed when I was young, the queer folk were kind of relegated to the best friend or the comic relief or whatever. And I, obviously I still want my queer people to be funny. Like I want my queer characters to make you laugh, but I want them to make you laugh in a way where they feel like a whole human being and not just the, the flat version of one. And so that's kind of what I bring to the table. I hope. <laughs> And so you, your characters like sort of like bring that queerness like maybe to the center. Is that what? Yeah, totally. I mean, I I, I think about um, like one of my favorite movies is My Best Friend's Wedding, and Julia Roberts's best friend is queer, and and you know he's played by a queer actor, and he's kind of 
one of the movies where I felt most represented, but he wasn't the central character of that story. And so I always like to think of like, what if I took that actor and put him at the center of his own love story, what world would open up there? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. Thank you. Amory, how about you? Um, yeah, I mean, I really, I feel like I really resonated with what Katie and Timothy said, because I also start with character first. Um, and I also come from an acting background, and I used to do like improv and like a lot of that kind of stuff. So I feel like generally, that's how I get my I feel for my characters, I just kind of like step into their head for a minute and like, well, let me just pretend to be them. Um, but I feel like, yeah, like, I, I think, for me, um, like Cafe Con Lichi has like a coming out like subplot, but like, for the most part, I don't really write coming out stories either. And I think that like, authenticity is really hard to pin down because like there is no one true story and there's no like if I write this I know it will read authentically for people and if I write this I know it won't um, but I think for me it just kind of comes down to like those queer casts like letting there be multiple queer characters and like not just like in the pairing but like also like in the side characters um, and like letting that queerness kind of like just be because like for me like in my real life like most of my friends are queer, like I have queer family, I have like, you know, queer people everywhere, like I work with queer people, and I feel like it would be weird, I feel like what makes it feel awkward for me is when you try to isolate the queer characters and make it where they're just like, everything is just extremely heteronormative, and they're just like, oh yes, queerness is just me wanting to like be a straight person, but like marry a guy, and I feel like there's just so much more to it, so for me it's just very like showing the like expanse of what can exist in queerness and showing like how that comes about when there are multiple queer characters on the page. Um, and I feel like that's just kind of how, I feel that's the only way it feels real for me. And so that's all, I hope that feels authentic. I don't really know. <laughs> I think it did. I mean, reading Me Too Diary, but I um, what I guess I guess I'm hearing is that, you know, queerness is part of life. You know, like there's, we're, we're all, we all have queer people around us. And before it wasn't written about, it, it was like, like maybe one side, character that was um that was queer and that was our token queer person or whatever and same with indians token indian person um so i'm going to stick with that authenticity question and go back to timothy and ask um do you feel like that you have to be in the queer community in order to write books uh, um that are geared towards the lgbt community community or have queer characters um that's a very interesting question i think for me I come from a place of wanting to write queer stories because I'm kind of funneling my lived experience in onto the page. I'm, I'm writing the stories that I wanted to read when I was younger. I'm writing the stories that I want to read now. I'm hopefully putting out stories that I'll want to read 20 years in the future. I think there are ways for non-queer people to write queer stories that feel authentic, they can populate their story. Again, like, as we were all saying, we wanna populate our stories with lots of queer characters because there's a multiplicity um, in ways of being queer. There's, there's no one queer experience. And so in that same way, when I open up a, a romance novel, I, I read straight romance novels all the time. I mean, you know, and, and, and instead of having to read against the grain and be like, where do I see myself in the story? It is nice when there are queer folk around that straight couple who, you know, because, you know, I also have straight friends. And so I, I do think that there are <laughs> writers, I have straight friends, it's a shock. Um, <laughs> um, I just feel like that there, there is um, a respectful and nuanced way for a non-queer person to write queer characters. Um, there is also the opposite of that. And so as long as you're going into it with um, willing to listen and learn and do no harm, mm -hmm. then I think there is, um, there is, there is space for you there. Mm -hmm. Emery? Like, I feel like it's one of those, like, that's a, it's like a really loaded question, right? Because like, is there like, is it possible for like a straight person or like a cis person or like, you know, an allosexual person to like write like a completely different experience in their own? Yeah, like it's not impossible for anyone to do pretty much anything in writing. Like, I feel like that's what makes writing so much fun. But then I feel like it also comes down to the question of like, why are you doing this? Like, are you doing it because you think that like diversity is marketable and you're gonna be able to capitalize on it? Are you doing it because you feel like you have more to say about our own community than we do? Are you doing it because, you know, you want to be praised for like representing us? Cause like, if you're doing it for one of those reasons it's probably gonna be really bad. And like, I think that's something that people just don't get is I think people go, well, can I write this? And like, yes, you can for sure. You absolutely can. But then the bigger question is, should you write this? And I think that comes down to like why you're writing it and why you want to. Like, I think, I think like, you know, 
a non-marginalized person can write a marginalized character well. That's absolutely something that can happen. But like, there's a lot of like questioning your own defaults. There's a lot of, you know, understanding people around you and like opening your mind in ways that you are not naturally trained to do in society. Like as a person of color, I can write white people easily because I was taught to empathize with white people from the moment I was born. But white people were not taught to empathize with me. And that's something that I think when you wanna write like, you know, characters who are more marginalized than you, that's just something to consider is like, why do you want to? And like, where are you coming from in writing this story? Cause I definitely think it can be done well, but it takes a lot of work. And I think a lot of people feel almost pressured to write these stories. Like, oh, I should write diversely because I should, right? And it's like, do it if you want to, if you want to embrace that, if you want to like, you know, open your mind to these things then for sure do that. But like, absolutely don't, you know, step into it feeling like you have to, or because like, that's what your job and that's how you save the community. And that's how you help queer people. Like queer people will help ourselves. Like, you know, there are other ways you can be an ally. And like, I think it's very important to just like, look at it as like, what, what, what is your goal? And like, go from there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Katie? Um, I agree 100% with both of you. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that like, kind of where, like, kind of like how Emery said is like, when you can get into the weeds with it, as if it's like, you know, I'm going to tell this story because like, I need to be the one to speak this story when you're not part of the community. And it's like, well, that's probably not your story you, you should not be doing that if you whereas if you're like doing the sorry one second get out go <laughs> I you're gonna have to tell the siblings I am so sorry <laughs> um, zoom um oh, okay sorry um whereas if like a lot of times in like romance novels if you populate your romance novels with side characters that are diverse and queer and what have you the natural inclination of romance novels is you tend to tell the stories of the side characters. And so if that is a very, if they're fully fleshed out and you're doing the work and you're putting in like, cause you have to do the work because you can't just be like, oh, it's just, you know, I know how to tell the story. It's like, well, especially if you're like a white cis person, you probably don't like, you probably need to like do the research and, and you know, there's a lot of ways to like diversify your worldview in a way that can help you tell these stories authentically. But again, it shouldn't be like, you should not be telling like a conflict where the identity is the conflict. Like that's not your story to tell like 99% of the time. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things like we, if you're on any TikTok video ever, you see like, well, can I do this? It's the way you can, but you know, like Emery said, ask yourself why you want to, and, and, you know, are you going to do the proper care and work to ensure that you're not, like, actively doing harm, um, and, you know, even as, like, people in the queer community, we still have to, we sometimes have to unpack our own stuff, and, and, you know, it's not, like, a free, like, green light of, like, oh, you just, you, you, you're part of it, good job, like, we can still do harm ourselves, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a very nuanced, like, you know, there's no, no yes or no answer there that's like nice and clean. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I didn't expect one because I, I think <laughs> all of those kind of questions are really loaded, as you said, Emery. Um, so Emery, I'm going to start with you on this question because um, it's about pronouns and the use of pronouns, the choosing of pronouns, which I know that you used neo pronouns yourself and some of your characters make that choice as well. So can you talk a little bit about, and we will all about um, what, the, what that means to pick your own pronouns and um, you know, why do people do that? Yeah, I mean, like, I think for me, like, at least in terms of like storytelling, like for me, it's just a matter again of like authenticity. Like for me, like as I'm writing a character, like sometimes I'll be like, okay, like I, I usually start off with most of my characters being cis. Like that's usually my default. Um, with the exception being Noah, the main character in Meet Your Diary. Um, but as I start to write the characters, I'll start to be like, you know, this character feels non-binary, this character feels trans, this character feels like whatever. And like, as I like explore that, I kind of like, you know, go through, well, based on this character, like where they come from, where they're going, what's important to them, like, how would they identify? Like, how, how, what would make them most comfortable in their own skin? And I think like pronouns are something that people like think about as like this really like concrete specific thing, which they're not like, 
pronouns are literally just whatever people feel comfortable with. It's the same as like your name. Like, you know, you can go by your, your full name. You can go by a nickname. You can change your name entirely. You do this just because you want to feel comfortable when people talk about you and people talk to you. And so your pronouns are just words that make you feel comfortable when other people call on you. And so for me, it's very much just like getting the vibe of the character and like, you know, like I have some non-binary characters in other projects who use like he, him pronouns or use she, her pronouns just because for them, you know, based on their priorities, based on like what feels natural for them, like that's totally, but that fits their character. Um, meanwhile, for Devin, I didn't feel right like having him use like super like binary pronouns. So I have him explored throughout the story. And that was just kind of to, you know, I knew I, when I started writing, I didn't know what pronouns Devin would use. And so that exploration was for me as much as it was for him, just to kind of like um, feel it out and like feel what felt natural. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, Katie? Um, I, I have pronouns are something that I've like been, I've like, I guess learning about in the last couple of years, just because non-binary is like a lot more present in, in, in like main discourse. And so with that in mind of like surrounding myself with people who are not just straight up cis people and like kind of hearing their Wow, words are hard. I'm sorry, my head is like doing the thing. Um, fever. <laughs> um, but I just feel like, like similar to like sexuality, like if you have only cis people in your book, that's not really reflective of the world, of my world anyways. And so pronouns are something that having characters that aren't just straight up binary is like, just makes sense to me. And, and similar to how Emery said, like it, has to be specific for that character to feel like right for that character and it's not necessarily something that's like well i need to check off this list of like make sure i have a non-binary character and whatever it's more like this character because i write intuitively i don't plot out a ton and so it'll be a character will show up and i'll be like oh vibes okay like this person you know this is what i'm feeling for this and then as the story evolves sometimes that sticks and sometimes it moves in a different direction but it's it is a lot of it just straight up vibes. It's like, oh, like this is how this feels. Like, I don't know if I can exactly explain why this works, but it feels good for this character and which sounds like weird, but like, that's kind of how I roll. No, that I'm not a writer, but I, I sort of get it. <laughs> Timothy? I feel like Katie had it spot on with the vibes because queerness, queerness is kind of a vibe <laughs> um, if you think about it and like, sexuality and gender, these spectrums that that um, the individual explores, our characters explore them on the page. And so when we kind of, because we're the author, like gift a character pronouns, again, we are, um, like Emery was saying, like giving them comfort. What What's going to make them comfortable? What's going to make them feel safe? How do they navigate the world? What situation are they in? And I feel like um, that's work that one, never stops. And two is, very complex. Um, and especially for the three of us when we're writing like romance novels, you know, we want our readers to come in and, and feel, again, like I mentioned earlier, comforted. And so the ways we can do that for other queer folk is to reflect the queerness that we see in the world, because that's that's what they need. Um, so for instance, I mean, I read for the first time this year, um, a friend of mine, Anita Kelly, put out um, a wonderful novel called Love and Other Disasters, and it has a non-binary protagonist in it, and they go by they, them pronouns. And um, reading that book was the first time I had read um, a romance novel with they, them pronouns in it. And as I was reading it, I realized I was kind of like having to uncheck my own um, my own preconceived ideas of pronouns because as I was reading the book I was like oh like I, I would get to um, themselves specifically and I would stumble I'd be like oh nope I, I read I read that wrong and now I'd have to go back and so as you know speaking with other readers and people who read that book there was something about that experience that says like well this is my world I use they them pronouns with friends all the time and and we need to normalize that kind of experience on the page too so that we can rewire our brains to say like this is, this is everyday life and everyday life should be reflected in our books. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to stay on that for a minute and ask Emery and go back around about, um, I, I've heard from your character perspective, what do you want the reader to get um, from 
you your character choosing their pronouns like i think and i think this is something that i've grappled with a lot recently but like i don't really think about what the reader is going to get a lot when i'm writing something like to a certain extent i think about like what i as a reader look for and like what i as a reader would want to see more of and that's kind of where i write from like I don't really expect readers to change their worldview because they saw a character changing their pronouns in my book. And like, I don't expect it to have like some earth shattering effect on them. Like, I just want them to see that it exists and like what they do with that and like how it affects them and like what they gather from it is entirely up to them. Like I reading is not a passive experience. Like what you gain from a book is all about what you put into the book. And so like, you know, I, I'm just like, this is something that I know exists. So I'm putting it out there. And like, I hope people, you know, see that it does exist and that's that's all i got <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot <laughs> um timothy what was the name of the book that you just mentioned uh love and other disasters by anita kelly all right somebody just asked that so um how about you katie what do you what what do you want to put out into the world not, maybe not just in terms of pronouns but um that's sort of where the questions start um i just i write for joy and so where i've landed with like my books is just queer joy and it's just like it looks a little bit different with each couple and each like or couple plus thruple um and it's just to because i i feel like just carving out my little circle of like the world and being like here's this thing it exists like it's you don't have to be weird about it like it's just it's it's not even like a talking point of like yes this weird's taking this for granted and I, that's not unfortunately how the world works but having kind of like low-key exposing people to things like I don't have an agenda or anything it's just I write what I want to read but I have had a lot of readers come back and be like I didn't know that I felt this way until I read this book or I didn't know that I was like interested in this or whatever and it's just like a very you know like, like Emery said just sort of exposing people to things that are outside their or potentially outside their like life experience and it's it can be very revolutionary especially if it's really calm a lot more common and it is more common now in books than it used to be like five or ten years ago that it's like you know you're getting non-binary main characters and like a lot more trans characters and a lot more queer characters and it's it's less of like a we have our one book it's like oh now we have more books to choose from not enough never enough but more mm -hmm. and and so it's less of a because they're a little more mainstream it's making its way into hand, the hands of people that wouldn't have like necessarily like considered like outside their point of view and then they're like oh this is a thing I didn't okay like it, it's just like an empathy thing almost like it didn't you know it's similar to how like negative stereotypes are reinforced like it's a positive I don't want to say stereotype but a positive experience to potentially reinforce like over time thank you that was my cat yowling in the background <laughs> Zoom, as you said, Katie. Timothy, how about you? Um, for me, I mean, um, so Never Been Kissed, um, since this was my first novel, is a new adult book. And new adult doesn't really have a defined or a definitive definition in publishing. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, but for me, I specifically wanted to write novels that had protagonists between kind of like that early 20s experience from like 20 to 25, um, you know, the end of college right into that first like, what do I do with my life kind of experience because I felt like there was kind of an overlooked group there, um, especially when I was towards the tail end of college, I didn't know what book to pick up that would make me feel like, okay, like maybe I can do this because this character did that. Um, also for Never Been Kissed specifically, one of my um, kind of questions to myself was kind of what would happen if the protagonist of a YA novel didn't get his happy ending in high school, because we get a lot of YA romances where the happy ending happens at the end of the book and and then we don't really know what happens after that. And so since this is a second chance romance novel, these two characters had to go away for four years and do a lot of growing. And then they come back um, at the end of college this summer, right after college graduation. Um, and they they get to re-explore each other and relearn each other in a way that, um, and for both of them, they've come out of the closet at that time. For Ren, he is, um, uh, he, he discovers that he's demisexual over the course of the novel. And so he is, like grappling with okay I came out but it my labels don't feel correct and do I need labels and if I say I'm queer what does that mean will people will people be upset if I decide I don't identify that way anymore um and so I, I really wanted to make it feel like I kind of describe 
Um, I define new adult as like the Taylor Swift 22 thing with like happy, free, confused, and lonely in the best way, like miserable, magical. Yeah. So like, and I hope she doesn't sue me for saying that, but um, like, that's just kind of the vibe that I wanted to, to give out in this book. And I, and I hope that uh, queer folk who wanted to kind of either read um, nostalgically, like in hindsight, older queer folk who want to read nostalgically, younger queer folk that want to know what, what might be coming on the horizon or people living in that experience. Um, because my protagonist is 22 and I'm 25. So um, I was kind of funneling all my anxiety into this book. <laughs> I have to laugh because I, um, your, you know, second chance romance is 18 to 22. Whereas in the books, most of the books that I've read, they're like 20 to 22. And, and then they like meet again when they're in their mid thirties. And it's just such a difference, you know, but four years, as you said, can be such a difference for some people. Yeah. And I think specifically like, I mean, even for folk who don't go to college, people who do go to college, people who get their first job, you um, learn such integral things about yourself in that span of time. And I think there's a lot of focus put on like in high school, you learn everything. And by the time you're done, you are a fully formed human. Mm -hmm. I think Ren even says like, you know, I was told by all the media or all my friends that coming out of the closet was like crossing the finish line. And now I just got to wear my medal. And he's like, why do I still feel winded? Like, what, what am I doing? Um, and so <laughs> I wrote a book for the people who still feel winded. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so I'm going to change a little bit. I probably going to ask this one more question and then hand it over to our attendees who do have some questions. Um, and I just want to, because we are talking about romance books, talk about the sex because we have books here from Jessica's to just everything. Um, <laughs> and for that reason, I'm gonna start with Katie because you're sort of like just everything with no labels. You have a feeling, your character has a feeling and they act on it. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, I, for the most part, I very intentionally don't use labels about like, be, about like identity or sexuality or whatever in my books. It's just like, oh, I had, you know, an ex or whatever. It's just, it's kind of filtered in, which is really interesting when you're writing like bi or pan characters who end up in like a, uh, like outwardly hetero, like appearing um, book or relationship because a lot of readers just don't pick up on that. They're like, oh no, it's fine. Um, but as far as the sex goes, I, because I write so heavily character first, um, that very much informs like the sex is very much an extension of that and makes it very unique to each couple or throuple or however many um in a way that like it's just very unique to those characters and I enjoy the sex scenes just or writing the sex scenes just because it tells me so much about those characters in those scenes because they're so vulnerable even if they're not necessarily trying to be emotionally vulnerable but physically vulnerable like that that forced trust of like connecting intimately is so so much character work is done in those scenes and so that's kind of how I approach it I don't usually like go in thinking like oh this is you know Achilles and he has a such and such like preferences or whatever it's just sort of like it's I, it vibes it's all vibes it's like well this feels good for this dynamic the dynamic here is going to feel different than the dynamic here because they're a trio and so it's it, there it's like it's three separate relationships and then the central one as well and so that is reflected very much in like the sex scenes because the vibes are different with each encounter mm -hmm. yeah i i love your book so <laughs> you're doing something right um Timothy, how about you how do you make those choices in your in your books yeah so again i'm um, like katie was mentioning i also since i write character first it's um, putting myself in the shoes of the character and deciding what intimacy looks like for them, what romantic attraction looks like for them. So with Ren and Never Been Kissed, um, I had pitched this book. I think I had written two chapters and was like, oh, this character is demisexual. And I wrote three chapters and I was like, oh, he doesn't know. And so as the book kept like kind of progressed, I was like, well, there's just, you know, this is a kind of, it's 276 pages. Like there, there wasn't um, in one summer Ren as a demisexual person was not going to come to a place where he felt um, ready or was feeling the attraction that he was, was he was going to um, have sex. And so Never Been Kissed, you know, includes kisses, you know, not to spoil it, he does get, he does get his kiss before the credits moment. Um, 
And so, and other forms of, and there are so many other forms of intimacy um, in, the, in the novel as well. And that includes, you know, conversational intimacy, um, being vulnerable in that way. Um, but then for instance, my uh, second novel, which comes out in October, which I mentioned earlier, you're a mean one, Matthew Prince, um, is a forced proximity romance. Um, mm -hmm. It's an only one bunk, bunk bed romance um, <laughs> and with two allosexual queer characters. So there's a lot of sexual tension in that book and things, you know, get steamy after a while. And again, I, with character, it's how, what am I feeling? How am I acting on it? And how do I express that? How do I ask for consent to do that? How, like all these things that you kind of have to grapple with. And I agree with Katie, they tell you so much about the character. Um, and so uh, I think there's, there's a whole spectrum of intimacy and I have fun exploring it through the eyes and experiences of the character. And I let that dictate the story. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Emery? I write YA um, and like sex exists in YA, um, but like also like, like, you know, as we discussed, like I put myself into a character's head. I never want to put myself into a teenager's head for a sex scene. That just makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but like even beyond like just like that concept, like I think like growing up, I always thought that you had to have sex in high school. If you didn't have sex in high school, your life was over. You would never have sex in your life and everything was over because every YA I ever read as a teenager ended with the characters professing their love and having sex. Mm -hmm. And like, as like, like, I'm a person on the asexual spectrum. Um, and so like, I felt so pressured to want sex that at, in high school, I was willing, like, like literally if anyone had said, Hey, have sex with me, I would have said yes right now just because I felt like I had to, or I was gonna like expire if I didn't. Mm. And so like, as a writer now, like especially writing for teens, I'm like, is sex necessary in high school? No. And like, like I think, especially with queer teens, like I feel like everyone I know is one extreme or the other, either they were like, you know, having sex in middle school or they did not have sex until after college. And it's just like, this, like these like extremes where like, I feel like, you know, either we have a lot of sex really young or we just don't get around to it. And so I kind of write for the kids who don't get around to it. Um, and I feel like it's just like the idea too, that like, you know, you can have romance um, and you even, even between allosexual characters, sometimes like with my first book, um, the love interest is ace. Um, but in my second book, they're both allosexual. Um, but I just feel like in general, like, I feel like there's a lot of like room to kind of have like, you know, stories that just don't default to these characters are in love, so they must have sex. And so that's just something that I, I feel like for now, at least is what, generally what I write. Mm -hmm. Because that's a choice too, as they all are. Um, so moving on to some of our uh, attendee questions, Jeremiah wants to know, and I'm gonna start with Timothy with this one. Would you ever write a straight character? I only ask because I'm a que I am queer, and as a storyteller, it does not interest me. I would have to say it also does not interest me. <laughs> um, and I would only say this because when I so I started uh, started writing with the goal of being traditionally published when I was very young. I was probably like 15 when I was like, I'm gonna have an agent. I'm gonna have a book. Um, and when I was writing those, I was very focused on saying that like the queer people can be on the sides because that's what I've seen in movies and books but the straight people are at the center and I wrote a lot of practice books that will never see the light of day with straight characters and I didn't find fulfillment in telling those stories and also because again I'm a queer person living life day to day surrounded by other queer folk absorbing their stories going out you know and this is just the world that I populate and I want to be able to tell stories that feel um, you know, the stories that I want to read are reflective of the life that I lead. And so I don't, I don't think I would write a straight lead. Of course, straight people sometimes sneak their way into my books. I try not to let that happen. <laughs> um, but yeah. How about you, Emery? Um, yeah, I mean, it's similarly, I started writing when I was young. Um, and I remember I was writing like in middle school, like, and I remember I had like, a, it was a whole straight cast with a gay side character. And I remember thinking, this gay side character is the only one I really relate to. Can't imagine why though, because I'm straight. So like, that was, you know, my life back then. I feel like as a kid, I always thought that like the characters I liked had to be side characters because the types of characters that I relate to are generally not allowed to be main characters. They're seen as unlikable. They're seen as too aggressive. They're marginalized people. And it's like, we're always relegated to the sidelines. And like, it just feels like at the end of the day, like, I, why, like, if everyone else is relegating me to the sidelines, why am I going to do that to myself? Like, if I should be the one person who says, no, you deserve to be the main character. Um, and so, like, I, you know, I don't really want to write a straight character. I mean, I would consider writing, like, a straight trans character. That counts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it all counts. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about you, Katie? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I have written straight characters. It's fine. It's whatever. I, I just, I find so much joy in the stories I'm telling now that it's, as my readers kind of say, we just sort of assume everyone's querying us told otherwise, and we're no, usually not told otherwise. So like, meh. Like, and that's just kind of my happy place is that like, that's how I move through the world. And it just feels very natural to extend that to my characters. It, it, it sometimes it's different flavors or it looks a little bit different than like my personal experience, but it's, it's very much not a straight, like it, it's a very crooked line. So, um, so yeah, I, I mean, never say never, but like, I don't, of the like, however many books I have in my head right now, none of them are straight. So probably not, not anytime soon, if ever. <laughs> <laughs> I would be surprised yeah because like again you know you're all of your characters all three of you have such um in-depth and well-rounded characters and you know that's not that's just one part of them they they have like this whole life in addition to the fact that they might that, that they're queer or trans or whatever it is so um you know you've built these worlds that are just wonderful so it, you know the stray <laughs> i'm gonna stop there because this is about you guys um so emory i'm gonna start with you on this question um Elif asks, ace characters are pretty rare within narratives. What are your thoughts on ace characters and representation within LGBTQ narratives, especially when the community and the romance genre tend to celebrate and emphasize sexuality within narrative? Um, you had mentioned ace before too, so I just wanted to start with you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, and I do feel like, I feel like ace people are overlooked. I feel like, and arrow people as well, I feel like in general, we're just completely ignored in the queer community. Um, and like, I don't, I, you know, I, I, yeah, there's nothing I can really do beyond that. But um, yeah, I feel like in general, I think that queerness, and I, I think it also a lot of it comes down to that, like that phrase, love is love, right? And like, there's a lot of this emphasis that queerness is about like who you love and how you love. And like, you know, when you're arrow, you're ace and you're trans, no, it's not. Um, and so like, I do like to include ace characters in like my work. I mean, my first book, I said, has an ace love interest. My second book does not have an ace character in it. Um, my hopefully third book will have an arrow protagonist um and it's just kind of like i feel like it just kind of comes down to like again like this is just something that i know it's just something that's natural to me and it's something that's normal to me um and so if the character fits the vibes i go with it i run with it i take it wherever um and yeah i mean i, I think it, it's it's hard because like i write romance right so i love like writing like love and affection that kind of stuff um but i also like writing arrow and ace characters um and i think like it creates a different type of love story and like I don't have like the time to go into like the whole lecture beyond it but I do think that like in general publishing is opposed to the way that Arrow and Ace people approach romance and so we're seen as like childlike um as not being affectionate enough as taking too long to get into it as not having enough sexual tension um and so like it really is hard to write Arrow and Ace characters in the forefront of romance I'm trying um but you know I feel like right now where I'm at is kind of is kind of like the extent of what I've been able to do. <laughs> um, how about you, Katie? Um, I mean, I write erotic romance, so it's a little tricky because although Ace is obviously a spectrum and it's not, there's no like monolith experience to Ace, I am probably not the person to write an Ace protagonist who's at, like, it's just, it's one of those things that's because as Emery said, there's not that many out there and it's, I would feel uncomfortable like inserting myself into that type of story because it would feel almost like it's just it, it, I would I don't know that I would be able to have the nuance to do it properly especially because the heat level that's expected in my books and so I have I, I there are they populate my books there are people or the side characters but it's just as far as main characters go I haven't and I don't know at this juncture that I will I'd rather uplift at, like ace people telling ace stories or yeah so mm -hmm. um just because the erotic romance makes it a little you know as emory said it's, it's there's certain things that like romance expects and that kind of feels like it would be challenging to navigate for somebody who's not ace or arrow mm -hmm. and also we talk about authentic authenticity we want it to be you don't want to just put a character into a book right to right. make sure that there's representation of that character, that that character or that um, background. Um, Timothy. Yeah, 
So, I mean, for me, so in, in Never Been Kissed, like I said, Ren uh, finds out over the course of the book that he's demisexual. Um, and so that, you know, is, is part of the, the ace spectrum. And for me, one of the predominant themes of Never Been Kissed is um, Ren grew up on a diet of like Nora Ephron rom-coms and he's very confused when he doesn't meet the benchmarks. Well, I haven't had my first kiss. Now I haven't had, like Emery was saying before, I haven't had sex. I haven't had my first kiss. I came out not that long ago. I kind of feel like everyone has lapped me and now I'm kind of left here in the dust. And so um, one of the things that he kind of comes to terms with over the course of the book is, well, queer people don't exist on the same relationship timeline that their straight peers do. And that we experience our quote unquote firsts at different times. Sometimes we don't experience those firsts. And we and, and Ren's like, I need to strip away all the pressure from these romantic ideals in order to be the person I want to be and exist in the relationship I want to exist in. And maybe that's no relationship. And so I just think that um, specifically, I mean, just to shout out some books that I love, I mean, like Loveless by Alice Oseman, The Charm Offensive by Alison Cochran is an adult romance that has a gray sexual protagonist in it. Um, so so in, in romance, I, I do see um, The Romantic Agenda by Claire Kahn um, has ace characters in it. So I, I do see, um, especially specifically in adult romance, that there are queer creators who, you know, either openly identify or don't openly identify on the spectrum who are writing these characters and saying that like queer folk, no matter what, where we land um, with our sexuality or, our, um, our, you know, our love stories are inherently not going to map exactly onto our straight peers. And so we have to tell our stories differently. Mm -hmm. And we're inviting you respectfully, like you're coming into our home, you're wiping your feet on the mat, you're taking your shoes off into our home and, and enjoy, enjoy the ride um, kind of thing. It's awesome. So um, we're getting to the end and there's a comment and a question that sort of go together. So Chris says that representation matters as a black queer woman, seeing queer people represented in more stories, games, et cetera, is so special to me because I never have never seen that when I was growing up and questioning my identity. I'm happy to see it now. And then Jeremiah asks, what do you think of the surge in LGBTQ books in the past few years? Katie? Uh, I think it's awesome. Like, I mean, it when it, the prevalence of more being available means that it takes some of the pressure off each individual book to be the perfect queer experience because there is no perfect queer experience because again, we're not monolith like in any way, shape or form. And so the more that there are out there, the more chances there are to somebody pick up a book and be like, this is exactly my experience, this is awesome. And it allows more room for queer creators to tell the story that they want to tell without having to adhere to like external expectations of like, well, that's not what a queer book looks like. It's like, okay, but like, there's a lot of room for, there's a lot, there's not just one story and up until like, you know, initially when it was like, you have your, you know, quote unquote token, like you, you'd have your token queer book that it's like, just like you have the token gay friend or whatever. And now it's, I mean, again, we're not, it's not as prevalent as I'd like, you know, it, just cause you know, it's still not, but it's so much more that you can find these books now that, that have identities and sexualities and like just stories that are so much more varied and I think that's freaking awesome and I want more. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's freaking awesome also. Timothy. Yeah I, I mean I would say bring them on. I want more queer stories. I will always want more queer stories. Um, this maybe doesn't answer the question but I also think that like the prevalence of um, queer books coming out over the last few years especially queer romance novels I would just like love to see like a Marvel Cinematic Universe just with like all the characters ranging from YA to a to whatever like just some kind of like really large tome anthology where every author writes a story where like all these I don't know maybe they're at a queer resort on a queer island somewhere I just like I think it's beautiful and I would just love to see some of these characters cross over into other worlds and narratives. You know, I mean, like, I don't know what the characters in Never Been Kissed would be like, you know, on Olympus, but <laughs> I certainly think there's something interesting to explore there. So, yeah. A crossover, I love it. <laughs> Emery? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree like completely with like, um, with all of that. I think one of the big things that I kind of like also mentioned too was just like, 
it's it's a little like for me i get a little bit of whiplash when i look at like queer books now because there are so many more queer books like you can't like you walk into a bookstore and there's queer books everywhere and it's like amazing and it's beautiful and i love it but at the same time like when i look for my specific identities i still can't find them and that's not to say they don't exist like they are there they're on shelves but it's like you have to, like for every like list of queer books for every shelf of queer books like the number of trans books the number of ace books the number of arrow books the number of books with people of color the number of disabled people is so low because right now, like the priority has been white gay men, white cis gay men, and white cis gay lesbians, and like white bisexuals. And like, it's like this idea almost as something I've said is like, it's like almost like that like we go through the alphabet, but we are only allowed to get the first couple letters, LGBT, and then just T kind of coming in now a little bit, not really. And anything in the plus is just completely non existent pretty much for those parts. I feel like, again, like a handful of books. Um, and then we get into intersectionality, it's also not there. And it's just one of those things where it's like, I always want, I always say, like, I'm so happy that we've gotten this far. And I'm also so disappointed that we're still only here mm -hmm. because it's like, there's so much. There's so many more like books and there's so much more opportunity for queer people, but there's still a very persistent narrative that essentially says intersectionality and like, you know, anyone in the plus, anyone beyond the queue is unimportant in comparison. And I would just love for us to reach that point where it's everybody and we're all everywhere. And I, I, I'm glad that we've gotten as far as we have. And I just wish it would, we would spread open a little bit faster, I guess. Well, you're certainly helping us get there, which is really wonderful. Um, so uh, one of the, Jeremiah also asks, and I wanted to as well, if you could talk about maybe a book, a couple of book recommendations for our audience. Um, what are your favorite LGBTQ authors or books? Maybe just a couple of recs. I'm gonna start with you, Tim. Um, so I would say Kasoko Jackson's um, Yesterday's History, which is the YA, and also um, his adult novel, I'm So Not Over You, is excellent. He also has another adult romance coming out in December, I believe, that I'm reading right now called The Dash of Salt and Pepper, which is also very good, so you should also read that one. Um, and I'm also um, in love, again, um, Anita Kelly's Love and Other Disasters and um, Alison Cochran's The Charm Offensive um, were two that I really loved last year. Awesome. Emery? Um, so one of my favorites from this year is The Lesbianist Guide to Catholic School mm -hmm. um, by Sonora Reyes. Um, that was a big one for me. Um, 1500 Miles from the Sun by Johnny Garza Villa. Um, that one I'm obsessed with. Um, Iron Widow by Sharon J. Zhao. Um, also Cemetery Boys um, by mm -hmm. Aidan Thomas. Um, and Hell Followed With Us by Andrew Joseph White. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to watch this over again and just write everything down. <laughs> <laughs> Katie? Um, I, I, so one that's actually coming out later this month is called The Final Strife by Sarah L. Arifi, I think. I constantly transpose the letters in her last name. Um, it's a fantasy, high fantasy. It's got a queer sub, like a romantic subplot that is like, enemies to friends to lovers but it's just like really satisfying and the world building is just phenomenal and I devoured that book like I am ready to start throwing it into people's hands because it is so freaking good um and another one that's also coming out this year either this month or August I'm not sure it's um a taste of gold and iron by Alexa Rowland mm -hmm. and it's got some of the best anxiety reps that I've personally read from my personal experience with anxiety. Um, and it's a queer love story between a prince and his bodyguard, who's kind of like a buttoned up bodyguard. And the prince is just an anxious mess. that's like trying his best, but kind of, kind of fucking it up. And, um, and it's just like lots of angst and deliciousness. And again, really great world building. And both those books are super character forward because I need a character to like grab him by the throat and drag me through fantasy. And they both have it in space. And I just, cannot recommend it enough and also oh no i'm gonna mess up the title uh t king fisher has a book coming out soon that has a non-binary protagonist and it's a it's like something with the dead <laughs> it's got a it's got a, a rabbit on the cover um but it's sort of a retelling of one of edgar Allan poe's short that i constantly i cannot remember because i am failing so much i should have written this down i'm sorry <laughs> um but it's that was really delightful like kind of like gothic horror-esque um but also like 
she writes the characters that are so very like normal like you read them and you're like this is what I would do in this book like yeah definitely um and so it's just very like approachable but also like you're like I'm a little scared of what's going on so highly recommend awesome oh my gosh like I said I'm just gonna totally um <laughs> I'm gonna... uh, what moves the dead that's what the title is what moves the dead okay I remembered it <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> fantastic so um let's just for our last minute um if you wouldn't mind telling me and us what is up next for you um timothy i know you had mentioned um the holiday book can you tell us yeah. a little bit about it sure so i have a holiday book coming out in october it's called you're a mean one matthew prince it is for fans of Shit's creek it is a forced proximity only one bunk bed holiday romance where a local college student and the spoiled disgraced rich kid have to plan a charity gala to save the struggling small businesses in this fictional berkshire's town and then i have um, another one more book coming out in fall of 2023 called new adult which is a queer spin on 13 going on 30. Ooh, oh my gosh that's so good <laughs> <laughs> Emery? Um, so I was in um, the All Signs Point to Yes anthology. This actually just came out like yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's um, an anthology full of um, romance stories um, based on the character Star Signs. Um, and then I'm also in another anthology out next summer called Transmogrify, and it's all about trans uh, magic short stories. Um, and then next year, I will also be releasing a web comic that I call like my queerest project ever, because it's just a very, very large cast of a whole bunch of queer people. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't wait. I love comics. So Katie, what's up for next for you? Oh goodness, okay. Um, <laughs> I have uh, I have a secret project dropping next month that I can't say anything about yet, but it, it, it's, it's dropping, I'm very excited. Um, and then in the fall in October, my I have a monster romance. It's, he's a crack and she's a lady. It's fine. It'll be great. Um, <laughs> and then in February is the fourth Dark Olympus book, which is Radiant Sin, which is Cassandra and Apollo that's fake dating for spy reasons. And um, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so <laughs> chaos. I have absolute wide spectrum of chaos coming. <laughs> well, I will look forward to all of that. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. This has been so enlightening and interesting and fun, I think. And I think that so many people in the world are looking for all of that and you bring it to us. So thank you. Um, I wanted to say that you can buy signed books from all of our authors from Bank Square Books. Don't forget because signed books are gold and it sounds like we have a lot of things that we can choose from. So um, please check that out. I put the link in the chat and um, I, you know, Timothy, Katie, Emery, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for having us. <laughs> Absolutely. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Bye. Bye.